So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Howe. I teach literature and I'm also associated with the program in digital writing and narrative design here at Marymount. Uh, so this is a new program that some of you may know about. Uh, it connects storytelling to technology and it's now in its second year. And with it comes the second annual digital writing and narrative design speaker. So today we're super proud to welcome Brian Tillman, who's the co-founder and principal of Punch Digital Strategies, which is, uh, as they market themselves, a full service branding, interactive and creative agency in Shirlington, right in our backyard. So um, many of you know that area already. Uh, Punch has actually just won uh, the Global InfoSec Award for Most Innovative Go-To-Market Agency for Cybersecurity Startups, which is something that's awarded annually by the Cyber Defense Magazine. So yay. <laughs> um, and uh, I just wanted to say a little bit uh, about Brian, who uh, I think will be a really great um, uh, representative for both the liberal arts and uh, the, the sort of professional world um, that, that connects storytelling to technology. So Brian has an educational and a professional background that I think might be of interest to some of our students. He earned his bachelor's at St. John's College, which is really well known for its deeply rooted embrace of the liberal arts tradition. Uh, and he's had a very rich professional life, which is still going, right? <laughs> uh, working since 2005 as a copywriter, an editor, and a digital marketing strategist. And then in 2012, he became the director of content and strategy at the Bornstein Group. And then most recently in 2014, he and his colleague Joe De Palma began Punch Digital Strategies. So um, today, Brian's going to talk a little bit about uh, how Punch came to be. And uh, he's also going to talk about the role of storytelling in his work. Uh, and one of the things that I really admire about Punch is their commitment to collaboration, to narrative, and to design thinking. They describe themselves, they describe themselves as a company that helps marketing managers and business owners see beyond the corporate standard and use digital tools to identify, engage, and inspire audiences to take action. So there should be a good amount of time after the talk for Q&A. So I encourage you all to note down any questions that you might have, or you can also put them in the chat for later. So uh, without further ado, uh, I hope you'll all join me in welcoming Brian Tillman. Thank you so much, Brian, for being here. Yay. <laughs> right on. Well, thank you, Dr. Howe, for having me. Uh, this is, uh, I'm very excited to be here. This is um, a long time uh, in the works. I think we first talked maybe 2019, pre-pandemic, uh, and then the world's kind of come back together. So it's nice to be here, and I appreciate it. Uh, and this program sounds like uh, incredibly interesting. I mean, when I was in school, there was, uh, we didn't even have internet. And this was like in the early 2000s. So the fact that this is now a program and it's something that um, is very relevant for the world today, I think it's really exciting. So congrats to everybody for being able to, you know, be a part of it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, Punch and how we got here, a little bit about my personal story, and then um, go into some examples um, and things that I think are important for, for digital storytelling. Uh, but I'll start um, just with a little personal background. So um, as, uh, as you heard, um, writer and strategist by trade, uh, sandwich enthusiast, uh, I will be happy to make you one uh, sometime. Uh, it's um, one of the most underrated foods. I have a uh, dad and husband. I have a, a five-year-old and three-year-old and uh, my wife of uh, 15 years. Play guitar, build guitars. I'm like, uh, you know, side uh, hustle. Um, but... Um, I really believe strongly that being a multidisciplinarian is critical to how uh, you can really realize your professional potential. Um, that started in, in you know, my early years and was really refined at St. John's. St. John's is a place where everybody takes the same courses. You have no choice over who your professors are, which are called tutors. You have uh, no choice about your times of classes. It's a one structured program that everybody in the school takes. And what that creates is a community where everybody reads the same texts, speaks the same language, and can communicate regardless of, of what year you are in school. Um, and it's a survey of the great books of the Western tradition. So it's, it's language, it's literature, it's philosophy, um, it's laboratory science and math. And it helps a person who may think that they are not a math person or not a language person really overcome that barrier and understand that there's, there, there are fundamental elements of, of constructing a narrative that are true about all of those disciplines. And that's something that, you know, that was important for me and it's something that I extracted and, and carry forward to today. Uh, it's been a long journey uh, uh, from uh, 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 you know, 2005 to today um, as a uh, you know, motorcycle roughneck to uh, bobblehead uh, agency owner. Um, 
I've worked as a sheepskin salesman, an antiques dealer, a bartender, where, warehouse person, uh, maintenance man, sailboat repair, uh, and then ultimately freelance writing, where I um, landed a job as a, a copywriter at an e-commerce company in Chicago. And that was my first real opening into the world of digital writing. Um, we had a city block of a warehouse full of uh, human skeletons, science equipment, beauty supplies, race cars, the most random objects you can imagine. And the job was see the thing, figure out what it is, write a compelling a narrative description of it and, and get it up on the website. Um, it was a similar approach to St. John's in the sense that read an unfamiliar text, come to understand it, figure out a way to communicate it back. That's a, that skill is something that we do every day in the agency world. And it's one of the most exciting parts of the agency world because you never know what, what client's gonna come in next. You never know what type of project's gonna come in. So the ability to, to quickly see, understand, and communicate back those fundamental elements of what the, the client is or what they do is a, just a core skill. And that's best done through a storytelling approach. So um, fast forward to uh, 2011, um, I came to Washington DC to take a job in strategic communications PR. Um, so it was more of um, uh, applying the storytelling skills to help businesses uh, communicate or advance their, their agendas. Um, and that's where I met a, uh, a guy, Joe, um, who, uh, you know, at the time, uh, a guy shows up to his interview, wears a, uh, you know, a, a Columbia fleece, and I'm, you know, fancy suit guy. And I was like, what, what is going on here? Um, we didn't hit it off at first, but after um, a little bit of time, we started to discover something. So Joe's background is as a designer, and developer and mine, obviously writer and strategist. Individually, we'd made a lot of websites. We'd created a lot of digital products. Um, his approach had always been, hey client, give me some words to put in this cool design. My approach had always been, take this beautiful novel and come back and make a website out of it. Uh, and we realized that when content and design were created intentionally in parallel together and thoughtfully composed, that the impact and the end result of uh, that experience are so much more powerful. I mean, ultimately, the job of, of communications and, and marketing is to persuade, to inform. Um, and in the digital media, that is not a, a, an exclusive responsibility of words alone. That's an responsibility of, of the interaction. That's a responsibility of the delivery through design, the technical performance through the, um, the system that you're using, whether it's a you know, website or web application. Um, and so, you know, at the time, my next move was to start an agency and, and Joe's intended to do the same. And we just said, well, let's let's just go for it and uh, and build a business around this idea of thoughtfully composing content and design together. Um, and then, you know, by um, that was 2014, by mid 2015, we had three employees. By the end of 2015, we had eight. Um, by the following uh, spring 15, and now we're up to 32, um, we have launched over 200 websites. Um, we have carved a niche in cybersecurity, which um, is an interesting and, and very um, uh, rapidly growing discipline right now, um, which touches everything from um, you know, computer science to data, uh, data science. Um, our, our whole philosophy and mission is to fuse design and content to create experiences users love. And for us, that's websites, that's uh, applications, um, it's video storytelling, and then building brands. Um, and so the folks you see here, this is you know, our team. There are writers, designers, developers, and multimedia producers who flesh out that model. Um, and very proud of like this exceptional group of people. Um, across the board, I mean, our clients range from product companies to, um, to services companies. This is just a, a, a sort of random cross section. Um, companies like IDME, who you may uh, be familiar with if you've had to do your taxes, uh, to uh, uh, companies like uh, SinSaver, who you may not be, uh, because they secure the power plants that keep uh, our lights on. Um, but something that's consistent across the board for all of these is really understanding uh, the, the unique nature of the audience and who they need to communicate to, understanding what makes those groups tick, and then creating a brand and message that's really going to resonate with them. Um, uh, yep, and uh, you know, as you, you heard, we've um, had some... Uh, some recognition and, and you know, that's always a, a nice pat on the back for a job well done. Um, 
we have an awesome office in Arlington uh, that uh, we don't get to spend a lot of time in anymore. Um, conveniently, like great business people, re-upped our lease for five years, uh, three months before the pandemic, and uh, now it's pretty much so it's vacant. Um, but, um, you know, we still maintain a great community with our team. And uh, even though we're, we're work from anywhere, so we have folks in um, uh, all across the country, primarily located here in D.C., but um, uh, in, you know, Atlanta, Nebraska, Wisconsin, uh, Oregon, and then we have a handful of people in Peru. Um, we're able to connect regardless of barriers, regardless of time zones, and really come together as one team, which is pretty fantastic. Um, so go, going back to what makes us different, um, I think this is something that's, that's really fundamentally different than other agencies of our type, um, is that uh, the message and the medium, the words and the design, the information and the user experience have to be an inter integrated process. Um, it's what the fusion of these things is what really creates that impact. I mean, think about um, how you engage with uh, content. You engage with content through your, your device, you engage with content through your, your computer. Um, it's an experience between you and a digital product. And it's in an interactive experience. And so when we think about how those things work together to create that effect, to, to make you feel a certain way, to make you think a certain way, um, that impact is more powerful. Um, our process, uh, in a, you know, almost every project for us involves a website. So website's a good uh, illustration of how um, a process works. We begin with information architecture to understand the organization and structure and also outline the user's journey. We proceed to wireframe where we have um, you know, the hierarchy of content defined and then into design and content um, for a homepage, design and content for interior pages. Um, our writers and designers are working uh, in an integrated way throughout the process. Um, one has to get done first, obviously, in order for the next to happen, but the opportunity to revise and, and uh, work together to create the best possible experience is something that happens at each phase. And I'll show you some example sites here in, in a few minutes. Um, that really execute on this idea. Um, so that's kind of the backstory on, on Punch. Um, but I, whoops, I wanted to talk for a moment about um, the idea of belief and the power of uh, how storytelling affects that. Um, when it comes to you know, your Amazon purchase, when it comes to a business to business um, enterprise software purchase, when it comes to how you donate to a nonprofit organization, you're making that decision based on belief. Belief is something that is um, ultimately non-reasonable. It is ultimately your choice to make a belief. And it's your choice to make a belief based on the information that's presented to you. We see this in our world today where we have, you know, complicated political environment. We have, you know, strife and, you know, with, um, issues regarding health and everything, there comes down to this fundamental pre premise of belief. And belief is hard to, to change, but belief can be changed through narrative. Uh, and so, you know, I, I was a kid uh, growing up, my dad was a Southern Baptist preacher. And so through, regardless of what that means for your, you know, what, so extrapolate, but um, every day there was, a, I saw a person using storytelling to advance an aim, to, to kind of, to, to make a case for something. Um, it's the same thing an attorney does. It's the same thing, you know, a business person does when they're making a sales pitch. It's telling a story and putting the pieces together in order to um, uh, persuade. So what we do in digital media is persuade and get people to believe. And for us at Punch, that is um, helping people understand the attributes of a software platform. That's helping people understand the differentiators of a consulting company. Um, but it's using narrative to connect the dots and help people believe. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to talk about three types of things that I think are very important to consider when writing, uh, for the web, um, and for a persuasive audience. Number one, uh, want, obstacle, action. Want, obstacle, action. Um, when I was in Chicago, um, I took a course at, uh, something called the Writer's Loft, a guy called Jerry Cleaver. Uh, he's a trained, uh, you know, SNL comedians, novelists. Uh, he has a, um, in Chicago, you know, there's this neighborhood called Ravenswood. There, 
sort of old houses and the back of the old houses, a lot of them have old garages and there's a literal loft he built on top of his garage. That's a big open room. And you go in there, you know, at 6 p.m. on a Tuesday with a bunch of other people and work on the craft of writing. And the thing that he drilled in over and over and over, if you remember nothing else from this course, it's want, obstacle, action. So this is, a, this is something that to, just really was driven home for me at the time. And it's something that I think about every time I'm writing, whether it's um, you know, a website headline, whether it's um, a case study, um, want, obstacle, action. The reason this works is because we need to put ourselves in the shoes of the customer for, for persuasive marketing writing. Um, we need to identify them as a hero and give them an, an objective. Um, an example of that uh, is a website we just launched last night. So uh, Human Security. Uh, Human is a bot detection platform. Basically, um, if you think about uh, your form fills on your website, some of those are bots, some of those are real. Well, what Human lets you know is know who's we real. The, the character here is, is me, the buyer, the person who has the e-commerce platform. My want is to know who's real. I want to understand what matters and how I can... Um, eliminate the traffic that's irrelevant, how I can better manage my spin. I do that by knowing who's real. But the obstacle to that, 77% of all internet attacks are bot-based. And the, the action, we stop them. So we, as your partner, help you find a solution for that. So in, in a very immediate and direct way, we're outlining want, obstacle, action here in just uh, the first you know, sections of a, uh, of a website. And this one is humansecurity.com if you want to check it out. This one we just uh, just launched last night. Um, so uh, this book is also available on Amazon if you want to check it out. So the most important thing, introduce the hero, insert them into conflict, force them into action to improve their plight, because in conflict, there's a story. Uh, one of the best examples from this in the classical tradition is the Odyssey, if you're familiar with that story. Um, Odysseus uh, gets... Um, sent away from home and his entire goal is get back to get back home the want is get back home the obstacle is every possible natural and supernatural uh interaction you can think of um and they're forced into conflict and there are a series of of events that happen um from you know sea monsters and whirlpools to cyclopses and uh singing uh sirens um that is a series of conflict. And that's where the narrative comes in. That's where the story, I mean, when he gets home, he just kills everybody and that's the end of the, the day. But um, in conflict, there's a story. So I think of this all the time in, in narrative writing, even in B2B context, um, illustrating the challenge that a potential customer uh, faces, um, pro providing some numbers to the conflict and then showing a course of action that they can take to, to resolve their situation. Um, one of the, the next most important points is give an account. Give an account. And what I mean by this is use orderly thinking to tell a story that has a clear objective and outcome. So um, I, business writing or, or digital narrative, the stream of consciousness Kerouac style just isn't appropriate. I mean, it's nice, you know, that, that, that was a movement in time and it's, it's great and everything. But what we need to do is lead people on a journey and give them a clear start and end point. And one of the works that I will recommend that may be a surprise is Euclid's Elements. So this is the foundation of our mathematical system, a foundation of geometry. What is, what is beautiful and perfect about this is the way that every proposition proposes an objective. It has defined a framework of characters, points, lines, angles, and builds a logical chain of events to, lead, to yield an outcome. Um, at St. John's, we had to work through uh, the, all, of, all of Euclid's elements. And so there's like, a, I don't know, hundreds of, of proofs. And every day we would have to memorize a proof, go up to the board, go through the proof and, and illustrate it back out to the class. What that was as, uh, an exercise in was um, certainly understanding how math works and that's nice and great, but it was understanding how to make a logical and ordered case. That's something that is intensely important when you're thinking through information architecture of a website, because you have to lead people from entry point to end point. And usually end point is some kind of conversion. It has some kind of business impact at the end of the day. Um, so working through start to finish 
uh, in a logical and coherent way uh, helps people really understand and, and you know, that structure holds the narrative together. So I'd encourage anybody, uh, we've, we've talked about this back and forth from at Punch all the time to do the, uh, the project of working through like book one of the elements where you assign a proposition to everybody um, and you have to go through and, you know, it builds good presentation skills too. Um, you know, and it's, a, it's an, another element um, in the connection between math and language and that idea that, um, uh, you know, our, our siloed sort of system of being a math person or a language person. Um, the idea of logical and ordered reasoning is something that connects both of those disciplines. What we're doing is pulling together characters. The characters have a systematic order that they must adhere to and then yield an output. So highly encourage you to take some time and uh, read through um, uh, Euclid's elements. If you haven't since fourth grade, uh, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, last uh, point on um, um, things to consider with narrative, uh, imagine, but also experience. So imagine uh, it's our job as storytellers to create something that doesn't exist. We are bringing into life uh, another world, um, another layer to reality that isn't the one that we, we are encountering every day, but that can only be done really authentically and in a really compelling way when experience is a component. Um, you know, I joked about uh, all of those different jobs and things that, that I had before ultimately landing um, in, you know, communications and, and marketing. You know, one of the things I ask uh, for uh, my uh, accounts people or people who are, um, you know, customer facing is, have you ever worked in a restaurant? Uh, because that experience of interacting with people and prioritizing uh, the urgency of different needs, um, learning how to read a room and communicate is, a, is an essential skill to the job of project management of a website. Um, so, you know, experience uh, goes a long way. And experience isn't something that's, that's constrained to time. So experience can be a volume too. We joke that like, uh, you know, one year at Punch is like five years in, you know, another agency um, because of just the, the sheer types of things that you get exposed to. And when we're looking at, um, you know, team members who join the team, it's, it's less about how long has the person been working or how, you know, storied their resume is. It's about uh, whether they can apply the experience that they have to, to present a creative solution. And that's shown usually through a portfolio. So I have a joking uh, picture about uh, Hemingway here. Um, the idea is if you want to write about fishing, go fishing. So, um, you know, H Hemingway is a pretty good example of somebody who um, has uh, walked the walk in some ways. Uh, he drove an ambulance and wrote about uh, World War I, um, you know, deep sea fishing and told Old, old Man in the Sea. Um, regardless of char character and flaws or not, um, there is a... Um, there is an authenticity that comes from doing the thing. So for us, working in the world of cybersecurity, you know, that's something that I had no background in prior to, uh, to um, you know, the opportunities that came our way. Uh, but it's something that we had to cultivate. So, you know, joining industry groups, um, uh, we attend uh, every uh, cybersecurity related trade show to interact with the people and understand, you know, the language. We do um, uh, surveys and, and uh, polls on things that we're creating with practitioners to understand whether or not we're, we're on point or accurate. Um, you know, getting to know and befriend the people in the industry helps uh, to build that understanding. Now, I'll say anything that we're doing, we, 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 have, we must be dangerously knowledgeable about a subject, but not to the degree that a practitioner would be. So, and that's appropriate and that's okay. I mean, our, our job is to understand it and communicate it back in a way that um, the, a seasoned and experienced person would understand. Uh, in the world of cybersecurity, um, their job is to find the anomaly. Their job is to look for the problem. So, so they will naturally poke holes in, in you know, sort of marketing fluff. So it's, it's important for us to understand and put ourselves in their shoes, understand their objectives and pain points, and really communicate on their own terms. Uh, and because authenticity builds trust and that fosters belief. Um, so... Um, these three points, uh, you know, I just really want to stress as, as foundations of how we approach digital storytelling and, and things that I would definitely recommend to the group. Um, so I'm going to uh, just show a couple examples here. Um, and I showed the, uh, the site uh, for human, which, you know, I'd encourage you to check out uh, humansecurity.com. Another um, uh, Black Cloak. So Black Cloak is a, um, 
cybersecurity, a concierge cybersecurity uh, protection service for executives and high net worth individuals. Okay, so that sounds like something for a very specialized group of people. Um, but there's, there's essentially two types of audiences here. There's um, CISOs, Chief Information Security Officers, whose job it is to make sure that their uh, company is protected. Um, and then there's uh, high net worth individuals and their family uh, managers. These are people who are ex accustomed to a certain kind of quality of life, a certain kind of luxury. Um, and so we needed to create a product experience that was on par with something that they would purchase from another luxury type of re retailer. So the, the charter from the client was make this like Rolex. And so we thought, well, how can we present a brand that is, um, uh, you know, has a user experience, that's something that's elevated, or really speaks to what the audience needs. So one of the first choices we give people right here is to self-identify. I am an executive, I am an individual. And so as we take the journey for executives, uh, want, obstacle, action comes into play again. So want, obstacle, action. So uh, the CISO wants to be able to secure their organization. They know that um, they are uh, at risk. And then action is we provide you a solution that you can use to then um, solve this problem. Um, it's a repeated formula that's used throughout this, the content structure here. We validate it with data uh, and then um, lead people towards taking an action and a journey or taking a journey towards taking an action on account of that. It's also reinforced with video content. So um, we've created a, a lot of video content for Black Cloak Cyber that really sort of a priority for your company. puts you in the shoes. Cyber and Cyber if you Cyber check out blackcloak.io, you can you know watch this and just stream it, stream it in, in real time. Um, but it's an example of how to connect in a very real way the people, um, the problem, and then validate with data and then provide them with a solution for it. Um, Black Cloak, we've, we've had a hand in really all aspects of the brand from the identity itself through um, its website and the product design, which a quick anecdote about the product, going back to that experience, um, you know, we had to think through uh, the overall out, you know, layout of information and the way to interact, but also the actual touch interactions themselves. So this Black Cloak app, uh, you see the, the one kind of peeking out here on the right, the buttons literally turn to gold as you tap them. So there's a there's a slight interaction that that reacts to the way that the finger works. So it's giving that person this positive reinforcement and sort of, you know, speaking to their um, uh, that you know sense of uh, luxury that they prefer in a digital product. Um, but Black Cloak, um, you know, fundraising is a huge component for technology companies. Everybody's got to go out and and raise. And so I'll give you a quick uh, example through. The Black Cloak um, uh, first few slides. So um, an executive's digital life is the company's weak, weakest link. So this is speaking to the CISO. So executives in their families, homes, and personal devices are targets which pose an uncontrolled risk to the corporation. CISOs try to protect the workplace, uh, but cannot protect executives and keep personnel in their personal lives. So again, want, obstacle, action. Want, obstacle, action. To date, there's been no, uh, there's have been no holistic solution. The scale of the problem, so using some data to, um, you know, uh, deepen this, the narrative, and then introducing the solution. Black Loop is the first holistic cybersecurity and protection platform, protects executives in their personal lives. Going through the, the overview of what's included, um, so to provide users that high-level understanding into the details, and then um, uh, this, you know, quote, secret sauce of how it all works. Um, this was something that ended up um, resulting in a huge uh, Series A raise for Black Cloak and they continue to grow. And I mean, these guys have doubled their ARR every month for the last uh, six months. So big growth path. Um, la last thing I wanna show, um, and then we'll open up for some discussion uh, is um, exercise examples of uh, digital storytelling in the exercise of branding. So one of the things that's a, a core aspect of what we do at Punch is help companies identify help companies, and that's voice and visual identity. Uh, we were recently working on a project um, for a technology company um, uh, that has created a product that is secure environments as a service. And just in layman's terms, what that means is your computer 
is a device that has an operating system, which is connected to an IP address, which is, has a user ID and a, a, your personal um, profile. What this product does is create an alternate version of those qualities so that a person can browse the internet securely and privately, feeding the tracking uh, systems um, all of those elements that they're looking for. So an actual ID, actual stack of identity that just isn't the user's identity. So what it enables is secure communication, secure collaboration, um, and just privacy online. So it's a, a pretty pretty revolutionary pro uh, product. Um, to those who are aware of it and you know familiar with the the notion. Um, the technical details kind of go without saying. Um, so what we have to do is really create a narrative and create a brand around it. So what we did with this product was a naming exercise where we created um, a series of product names, which we felt uh, accurately conveyed what the product value was. And we present those in a, a way that we call creative themes, which has um, a, you know logo design and a brand story, and then the systematic elements of design. So I'm gonna show you Hey, is that uh, Alejandro, a uh, former uh, intern? What's up? Uh, good to see you. Uh, how's it going? Uh, did you, I don't know if you were around when we did, uh, this was Replica, so it was right last, so it was last year, so probably not when you're out, but anyways, hope, hope all's well. Uh, all right, so uh, I'm going to show you theme number one, Replica. Um, so the, the original brand name for this company was called Opaque, which is kind of cool, kind of interesting name, but the problem with that is it's not, um, it's by definition, not transparent, it's opaque. And one of the fundamental uh, aspects of this is that it gives security people transparency into the operations of the company, into the, the connections and communication of the company. So transparency is fundamental, opaque doesn't work. Replica, so the story here, everywhere you go, you're under watchful eyes, they follow you, they document you every move. And when you're in the darkest places, there is malice in their gaze. If only there was a way to misdirect those watchful eyes, to give them something to track, to exploit, something to believe to be real, a replica. Only then can you dwell online securely. Replica creates authentic virtual environments that exhibit all the characteristics of an actual user in order to evade adversaries, protect identities and assets. Replica fully enables online privacy, reduces risk, and fundamentally changes how work gets done online. Fusing patented technology, field-tested tradecraft, and zero-trust architecture, Replica is what private browsing and browser isolation could not do alone. It creates another version, a Replica, that gives trackers and adversaries the data they want, but it's just information vapor. So our, our story here with Replica is that it's really creating this alternate universe. Um, and you can see sort of the systematic elements of design that came together um, and the narrative here and um, you know bringing this together through um, uh, representing the idea through color palette through you know some of the physical elements and things um, but this is just one direction um, our second option unseen see without being seen it's a fundamental premise of the intelligence tradecraft to be immersed in a scenario, part of the crowd, acknowledged but not re recognized, observant without being observed, to be invisible in plain sight in order to deftly accomplish the mission. There's power in being unseen. To be unseen is an advantage. Uh, with the unseen platform, users access this power to work, to explore, to investigate online with total privacy and anonymity. Unseen enables users to create authentic virtual environments that blend seamlessly to conform to the expectations of trackers, data brokers, and malicious actors, but um, the operative is indistinguishable from a crowd, unseen users have anonymity while still maintaining presence. So uh, again, you hear that want obstacle action coming through the narrative there. We present the problem and we, and we illustrate the solution. Um, the, uh, the final name option here that um, we had presented uh, is graphite and uh, the story with graphite is metal grinds against metal as the axle turns. That fine layer of graphite, almost transparent, adds a resilient barrier between the heated moving parts. It creates slickness, a sleek, though almost imperceptible layer that alleviates friction, that dissipates energy, that enables fast, free, fluid motion. And when you work, when you need to hunt threats, when you need to move seamlessly and stealthily through the friction of the online world, you use graphite. Graphite creates a protective layer around the online existence by creating a secure, authentic virtual environment. So when moving parts are covered by graphite powder, they may be no change to the naked eye, but a microscopic level, there's a hard protective surface. Two moving parts never touch. 
graphite enables function while ensuring stealth. So again, a different way to tell the same story um, that uh, builds on this idea of uh, fluid motion of, of um, you know, seamless and stealth. What we ended up going with with, the, with this project was a replica, a version of this um, uh, name and mark and style that just brought in some elements of the other. Um, and this is now uh, uh, online um, and pretty interesting take on sort of like you versus you with replica. It's the same thing, but it's just slightly different. So our, a lot of our work is, uh, you know, this isn't, um, you know, consumer products or restaurants and retail. It's a very, uh, you know, niche kind of audience, but it's one where there's um, a very knowledgeable buyer uh, who needs to, to see the value and be communicated to in a way where it emotionally resonates. Uh, so these were a couple examples of um, the one obstacle action story, the uh, logical order uh, from Euclid, and then that experience driven uh, approach. Um, so that's the, the uh, scope of what I'd like to talk about, but I'm happy to take any questions or um, if there's anything, you, you know, anybody would like to see. Thank you so much. This is fantastic. And I, I don't know if you noticed, but I was taking lots of notes. <laughs> so I'm sure that, um, that we all have questions. Um, I've been inviting folks to uh, pop their thoughts in the chat. So, you know, feel free to do that. Um, I would be curious to hear what you all think and how what Brian is saying might, you know, intersect with classes you're taking, uh, career goals you might have, questions you have about, you know, your core classes or um, writing, uh, any of these topics, I think Brian would be a very interesting um, perspective, right, to, to have. So, um, it looks like there's one question in the chat already from Johanna. Um, Johanna, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? Oh, okay. Hi. Good morning. Thank you for um, being here with us this morning, Brian. Um, so my question is, um, so I actually know someone that goes to St. John and um, I spend a lot of time with them. So I was wondering like how you got into this deal of technology because hmm. I know their emphasis, I, at least the school emphasis is very little on technology. So like, how is it they transition from like very little technology to like so much technology, which I, I'm just kind of like very interested or baffled yeah. by what, what a What a great question. Uh, so, uh, and I, I kind of joked about this early on, like we did, or maybe it's before folks uh, started, but you know, when I, started St. John's, we didn't even have internet at the school. Um, and I had to like, we had to go to the computer lab to type up papers. I didn't have a computer because it wasn't of interest. Uh, and I was definitely not a technology first type of person for, for a significant part of my life. Um, so what was, um, and, and you know, at, at the time, this was not a career path that was a thing that people thought that like at the school, the school uh, career services office is like, okay, go be a lawyer go back and get some more uh, math and do a, a medicine or go into academia. Those are pretty much the only funnels that they sent people to through, uh, through St. John's. Um, but one of the, the, if there was one big takeaway of that experience, it's not spending you know, four years studying Greek or like reading philosophy. It's the, the methodology and approach of the St. John's experience, which is um, take an unfamiliar text, internalize it rapidly, and be able to communicate it back in a in a clear and cohesive way. That's the that's the fundamental thing we did in language, in math, in um, laboratory science, and in our philosophy uh, seminars. Um, and that's the thing that directly applies to what we do today. So uh, I have no real technology background, but I'm doing um, difficult discussions with people who are computer science PhDs because it's about figuring out just enough to understand the framework of the, the, the scenario and be able to communicate it back. Um, uh, that methodology of, of um, sort of dissecting a text, looking for meaning and then in, internalizing it is something that a person can apply to any discipline, whether that's continuing a study with literature or whether that's becoming a tech. In fact, there's a handful of uh, folks from my generation who are data scientists now um, because they've kind of taken that direction um, 
you know, sometimes there's additional training and things needed in the actual code language, and that's the techne uh, of uh, development. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I, if I had one thing I'm most grateful of for that experience, it's that methodology and being able to apply that every day. Yeah, yeah. that's a great question, Johanna. Does that answer what you were kind of getting at? Yeah, um, I'm also getting a text wondering if you're doing any internships because I'm telling the person who like um, I yeah. I have in contact with, and they're like, do they do any internships? Because I send in like the page, uh, Dr. How send me, and they're like, oh, cool. Yeah, we have. We have done internships with St. John's. I had a uh, uh, Johnny intern uh, two or three years ago, and it was, a, it was a blast. He brought Lucretius in and was like reading on the nature of things to all our staff. And uh, it, was so, it was such a funny like disconnect between the folks who had like the, the, the different path and stuff, um, but a great guy and approached it did, did really well at strategic research projects where we gave them, you know, do a competitive analysis about these five, uh, um, you know, our clients, five competitors. Yeah. And he had a really good mind for that. Um, he's gone on actually to be uh, in data science. Um, gosh, I forget where, but um, he graduated maybe two years ago. Um, Avi Chawla is his name, uh, but great dude. So yes, feel free to share my contact. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you were speaking in response to Johanna's question, I was thinking about that, you know, that that um, that old saying, that old sort of, you know, cliche, right? A jack of all trades means a master of none, right? And it's usually seen as sort of this yeah. derogatory statement, right? But, yeah. but you know, those who are associated with or have a, a sort of uh, disciplinary history and reading yeah. and understanding the full context of the thing, you know, know that, that the full quote, right, the full proverb, right, is master of all, uh, jack of all trades, master of none, um, but frequently better than a master of one, right? Uh, yeah. So the idea, you know, is that by being able, I think, to kind of, to, to communicate across these sort of disciplinary boundaries, to learn those, those other languages, like you were, like you were saying, like just enough to be able to communicate authentically, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. then you can kind of add these, these other layers in and, um, and, and, and help people in all kinds of different sort of specializations, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was just thinking about that as you're responding to Joanna's question. So it's interesting. Um, it looks like Mina has a question too. Mina, do you wanna unmute yourself and, and ask your question? Um, yeah, thank you so much for um, this great presentation. It's, you know, uh, I'm so thankful for the experiences and all that. Um, and thank you, Dr. Hal, for inviting us to this um, meeting as well. Um, so I, I'm currently taking courses with Dr. Hal um, uh, of book histories, and we've seen how it progressed to, you know, what we are currently, you know, um, we, you know, the digital world. And I wanted to ask your perspective, like, I mean, from your perspective, what do you think the future holds for, you know, digital writing or the narrative design? And if yeah. you think as, you know, as a society, are we doing a good job of catching up with the whole, you know, drastic progress yeah. and this uh, advancements? Thank you. Yeah, that's, yeah, great. I mean, there's never been a better time to be a writer, I think. Um, because of the, um, the breadth of opportunities one has to publish. And that's good and bad. I mean, you know, when you think of something like, um, for example, Forbes magazine, Forbes magazine has uh, Forbes Technology Council or Forbes Contributor Network. So basically what a lot of people will do, and I've considered this myself even, uh, you pay $1,600 to become a Forbes contributor, then you write articles uh, and submit them to Forbes and they're published and you get credit for it and all that. You're not paid or anything. You basically pay money to, to self-promote. That's kind of the dark side of, of where things are now because a lot of, um, you know, like reputable publications are, are, um, are uh, outsourced or uh, crowdsourcing content. And that's great for, for them, for these, you know, for niche industries. And it's great for individuals to have this platform, um, but it's um, less curated than maybe traditional media had been. Um, but the, the other side of that is, there's a there's sort of unlimited opportunities to to plant a flag and use digital media to to communicate and so whether that's for money whether that's for a job I mean there's loads of opportunities in content creation which can span actual writing to multimedia um, 
there is no change to the pace at which we consume content and no change to the accessibility of that content. So with that in mind, you know, we will, we will be reading more, we will be um, consuming more. Um, and with that comes the need for good writers to tell the truth more uh, and really use um, digital media as a platform to, to connect with people. I mean, I think there's like, um, you know, people talk about like the web 3.0, this sort of like convergence of, uh, um, where we're no longer device dependent and we somehow have, you know, another level of understanding or a augmented reality or something like that, which is very likely going to come. But even so, um, that just yields more opportunities to interact and engage with, with people. And um, that has to be done through thoughtful and, and persuasive communications. So, I mean, I, I, I believe that it's probably never been a better time to um, be a writer. Um, you just have to pick the right avenue that aligns with what matters to you. Yeah, great. That actually connects really well, I think, to India's question. Um, India, do you want to unmute yourself and ask? Yes. Yeah, so I know that you said that you use um, your teaching to, with the storytelling approach, and I wanted to know if there were any challenges, and if so, how do you overcome it? Um, so I think um, challenges to using storytelling in, in uh, the work that we're doing. Um, I mean, un, you know, understanding the subject matter is always going to be, uh, you know, a challenge, and to be able to get to that level of understanding, I mean, it's something that our, you know, folks across the team have to come up to speed with. Um, communicating authentically, like really achieving those things that I had outlined of, of kind of putting yourselves in the shoes. That's not an easy. I mean, that that requires some work and effort. You know, the act of crafting the story, the act of like doing the writing, I think is probably the easiest part, um, because there is a degree of, um, there's a structure to follow for that. Um, but understanding the nuances, for example, we have a project right now that uh, we're doing some SEO content for a, a website that um, has, has very nuanced subject matter. And um, a simple turn of phrase can mean an entirely different thing. So that requires a lot of oversight. Um, so I think that at least in our line of work, the biggest challenge is is subject matter expertise. The, the discipline of storytelling or the approach to it or the methodology is if you can outline that and have a, you know, a solid reference of what to do, then you can apply that to really anything. So, I mean, you know, regardless of the multidisciplinary approach, everybody does have an aptitude. Some people aren't computer scientists. And so, you know, you, you may find difficulty there from time to time, um, but, yeah, have have a good uh, solid of methodology, and then that'll save you some some struggle. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Um, it looks like there's one more question in the chat uh, from Paula. Paula, do you want to uh, say hello and and ask your question? Hi. Yes, um, I am a professor here um, at the school of um, at the um, school of education, and I'm just curious about social media campaigns. It's, always been an interest of mine. And mm -hmm. so um, I'm wondering if um, you all support your clients in that work and how, and if so, how do you maintain that narrative that you've beautifully created um, with your clients through a website and branding and all that um, through their social media campaign? Yeah. Yeah. So good. So uh, good question. So um, and, and the point that that raises that I think is most important is co consistency and coherence of brand message. So that's something that um, we have a process that we call the brand operating system. It's a uh, an approach of competitor analysis, uh, user persona development, strategic messaging, positioning that we'd like to do at the beginning of a project that gives us sort of a rule book for how to communicate for all things. And within that, one of the exercises that we'll do, we call it social listening, or we'll take sort of a cross section of their competitors, use some tools to just scan and analyze the type of language that's happening around um, their industry and what they're doing. And then that becomes, that informs a strategy we'll give to them for, um, for how to communicate in those channels. Um, we produce a ton of social media ads. We produce a ton of video content for social. Um, uh, where we stop is like managing the posts and responding to their users. Now, usually that's handled by the, um, you know, the client. Uh, but, you know, the advantage to having that framework to start from 
uh, allows us to have a thing we can check against as we're creating content. Usually content has to, usually social media content is around campaigns. So for a lot of our B2B uh, audiences, it's a white paper that's about some relevant topic, like a some kind of topical insight or some kind of technology insight. So we'll create the white paper, we'll create this suite of digital ads. Um, so we wanna make sure that there's consistency in the message throughout each of those, uh, framing it in terms of the benefit to the audience versus the self-referential, hey, we've got this cool product. What does it mean for you, user? Um, and you know, checking it against that uh, guidelines. Um, part of the ex part of that exercise is a spoken word response. So giving people like actual language that they can communicate back with in real human terms, um, so that it makes responding to those kind of comments and questions and stuff easier. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah, Thank that's you. a great question. <laughs> Yeah, Thanks, yeah so, so social stuff because you know you get a real-time pulse on what's going on and there's always a chance that you um you, you have to be immediate and responsive and timely so um it's best handled by uh somebody internal um other than the creative which is you know an area that you know we do a lot of oh, great thanks um any other questions for our speaker today Um, I have a question. <laughs> um, what's your favorite part of the process? Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, so at, so I, you've seen this uh, up close. Uh, creative themes are my favorite part of the punch process. And so we just did this uh, presentation yesterday for a, uh, in, uh, it's a secure remote access company that works with uh, power plants and things. Um, and creative themes is like what we showed with Replica. It's a, it's a brand story, it's a narrative. It's really fun to, to pitch and kind of go through and riff with the client and like let them start to visualize the story. Um, and it's funny to watch kind of the wheels turning as you're going through, you know, we, we work on this stuff for weeks behind the scenes. And so we've seen it very intimately and then we put it up and people are seeing it for the first times. And a lot of times they're kind of like, you know, mind blown or like what, like a lot to take in. So watching that sort of processing happen is really fun. Um, so that's the, that's, you know, definitely my favorite practical thing, but in general about this industry and what this, this job entails, I think the funnest thing, the thing that like, I love about this, and I don't know what else I would be doing is, uh, getting to approach an unfamiliar subject and never really knowing what's coming next. You know, like there's a new client that's coming and we have to figure out what they are and learn about them and become knowledgeable. And so for a person who has, uh, like curiosity about learning and kind of like exploring new things it's a, just like a fantastic opportunity because it never stops you know there's always something new so that's you know that's what i really love about the work that we do yeah that's great um wonderful well thank you so much uh brian for for spending some time with us today we really really appreciate it and uh and i know that um several of uh, our students here today will be very happy to know that punch is uh hiring interns um and also they're hiring for uh full-time i think you said earlier is that is that right yeah we're looking for we have uh, like a senior account director role that we're looking for a um, senior copywriter role a designer um, and then a head of, uh, or a, um, website project manager type role. Some of that, all, everything should be posted on our site. Um, but I just dropped my email in the chat here. If anybody needs anything, feel free to connect. Great. Yeah. And I also put Brian's uh, LinkedIn account um, in the chat too. So feel free to reach out and ask any additional questions that you might have. And I just wanted to take a brief moment to thank you again, Brian, for sharing your time with us and your insights. So thank you so much. Yeah, Yay. Really you <laughs> it's such a right. weird, you know, normally there'd be a round of applause, but on, you know, Zoom, right. who knows? Right. <laughs> oh, oh, good. Well, I appreciate it, everybody. Alejandra, good to see you. Um, thanks everybody for your time today. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for coming out. Right. Okay. Take care.